We would now like to welcome to the stage the incomparable Winona LaDuke, who is going to be giving a talk called Cultivating Resistance and Lighting the Eighth Fire, Challenging the Fossil Fuel Industry and Restoring Anishinaabe Economics. Um, of course, Winona needs hardly any introduction. She is an internationally renowned activist working on issues of sustainable development, renewable energy, and food systems. She lives and works on the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota and is a two-time U.S. vice presidential candidate with Ralph Nader for the Green Party. As the executive director of Honoring the Earth, she works nationally and internationally on issues of climate change, renewable energy, food systems, and environmental justice with indigenous communities. In her own community, Winona is the founder of the White Earth Land Recovery Project, one of the largest reservation-based nonprofit organizations in the country. She also continues national and international work to protect indigenous plants and heritage foods from patenting and genetic engineering. And in 2007, LaDuke was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, recognizing her leadership and community commitment. In 1994, LaDuke was nominated by Time Magazine as one of America's 50 most prominent leaders under 40 years of age. She has been awarded the Thomas Merton Award in 1996 and Miss Woman of the Year with the Indigo Girls in 1997. <laughs> and the Reebok Human Rights Award, with which she began the White Earth Land Recovery Project. The White Earth Land Recovery Project has won many awards, including the prestigious 2003 International Slow Food Award for Biodiversity, recognizing the organization's work to protect wild rice um, from patenting and genetic engineering. Winona is a graduate of Harvard and Antioch universities. She has written extensively on Native American and environmental issues. As the author of five books, including the Re Recovering the Sacred, All of Our Relations, and a novel, Last Standing Woman, she is widely recognized for her work on environmental and human rights issues. Her latest book, her latest book The LaDuke Chronicles, is available here, uh, so you can check that out after her talk. Welcome, Winona LaDuke. Eileen, can you all hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, thank you all. That was amazing. I don't, know, I don't know how they did that, but that was just totally amazing. So thank you for uh, doing that. And, uh, I want to talk about uh, this moment that we are in, but in starting that, I want to say, Anin in Dinawe Maganaduk, Nikagwegitimagas, Bine Sikwe Itago. Makwa Ndodem Gababani Kog Ish Kanaganing and Dunjiba Miigwech. I'm uh, from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota, Oma King. I'm here from this land too, and I'm really grateful to be here with all of you. I want to talk about what it is to be a water protector in this moment that we are in. When in our teachings as Nishnabeg people, we refer to this as the time of the seventh fire. And in those teachings, it said that we will have a choice as Anishinaabeg people between two paths. One they say is well-worn, but it is scorched. And the other path they say is not well-worn, and it is green. And they say it is our choice upon which path to embark. So I want to talk a little bit about that and the process. And uh, isn't that cool? This is a mural that we just had put up, and her coming out party is today in... Uh, in Duluth, a water protector mural done by Votan, and she's about 50 feet tall in downtown Duluth, huh? To be a water protector, to be a water protector, and to make beautiful these towns and these cities that have been taken over by what I call the Windigo economics. How do we cover the beauty that is ours? How do we bring our faces back so they know who we are? And we are present everywhere. I love this mural and I love this woman very much. These are some of our water protectors from Standing Rock. This is where I live. I live on uh, Round Lake in the middle of the reservation, Gawawie Gamug, Round Lake. It's in the southeast portion of my reservation. It's the headwaters 
of the Otter Tail River, which flows into the Red River up to the north. My reservation is the source of both the Mississippi and the, and the headwaters of the Red River. From our territory, we look both ways. They say that the last Indian uprising in Minnesota was on Round Lake. 1902, our people stopped the loggers from taking our trees off of our land and using our water to transport our trees. They say it's the last Indian uprising. I always say we ain't done yet, huh? <laughs> so this is some art. Some of you will know this art. This is Ray Thomas. Um, and I really like this art for many reasons, but the piece is called We Are All in the Same Boat. I think that's quite accurate. But I also like to use this art because as you heard from my introduction, I was an undergraduate at Harvard University. And if you wanted to study the art of Europe, you went to the fine arts department. And if you wanted to study indigenous art or the art of First Nations, you went to anthropology. And I think that there is something to said, be said about the valuation of knowledge in these institutions of higher learning and how it is that some people's knowledge is valued as fine and some people's knowledge is not valued the same. And it is my humble suggestion that at this point in time, we are in the place where perhaps the solution to the problems created by this paradigm cannot be found within that paradigm. The solutions are outside of that, and we must be the people that have the courage to let go, to let go of some of those things. Often in our language, you know, this month here, we're just finishing Manome and Akegis. It's a lot of your Anishinaabe Moan speakers, I know, and so I tell you nothing that is new. Then we have Watibaga Gizis, when the leaves change color, Banakweo Gizis, when the leaves fall, Gashkadno Gizis, freezing over moon around November, right? Except for maybe this year because of climate change. <laughs> it's really warm. <laughs> and then we have um, Manitou Giza Soons, Little Spirit Moon, Gishi Manitou Giza, Great Spirit Moon. And then we have Nemebin Giza. I don't know if we all have the same moons in our territory, but in ours, the Sucker Moon, Onabana Giza, when it's a hard crusted snow moon, when it freezes, thaws, and then freezes again, right? Think of that as the moon, you don't want to do a face plant in the snow. Um, Iskigami, Zigigizis, Syruping Moon, Wabagana Gizis, our flower moon, Odaymen Gizis, our strawberry moon, Mean Gizis, our blueberry moon. I like to remember them and I like to say them because I like our language, but also, you know, you are an enlightened bunch here, but I know that you noticed that none of those moons is named after a Roman emperor. That is to say, it is possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire, nothing to do with colonization road, or any of that stuff, right? And I think that's about time, is to deconstruct that relationship that we have made. And some of us, we perhaps have drank too much Kool-Aid even in our own communities, that we believe that there is something to be said for the way that they practice their life. We are all, in fact, in the same war in this same moment. And um, you know, as I said earlier, in this time of the seventh fire, that was a teaching for Anishinaabeg people. But I'm pretty sure that we are all in the same boat now. We are all in the same boat, and we must make a choice about which path to go upon. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. I live in this reservation that is over there called White Earth, and uh, I didn't know much about the Enbridge Corporation or much about uh, Canadian oil pipeline companies. My territory is a territory which is full of wild rice and lakes. That's why I love so much. I love so much your music. But my territory has 47 lakes and 500 bodies of water. Our territories are almost half water in our region. We have six old Enbridge pipelines, the mainline system, put in in the, late six, in the early 60s, almost 50 years old, and those carry most of the oil down into the United States, and then they go up to Sarnia as well. That's line three and line five. And then they go down to the Kalamazoo spill area. Those pipelines were put in before any federal regulation, like the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act, and they were put in at a time of great duress in our communities when the federal government and the Bureau of Indian Affairs just allocated those leases. And so we already got the lines. We got the lines. And then the Enbridge Corporation announced in 2013 that they needed a new line. And the first line they proposed was one called the Sandpiper, a 640,000 barrel a day pipeline, they said, was essential to carry oil from the Bakken area 
across our territory. And like I said, I didn't know much about pipelines. And I'm actually not opposed to pipelines. I like water and sewer. I think those are excellent uses of pipes. <laughs> it's just what you put in them, right? You know, so it's not the pipeline itself, it's what's in it to me. And so they announced this line and I was like studied up and I was like all happy being a farmer and putting up wind projects and solar and I was like, dang, I gotta go look at a stupid mega project again. And so I look at this project and I started trying to educate my community about it and what was going on and then I looked around and our area is full of people, you call them cottages here, right? The north is full in our territory of million dollar cottages on all those lakes that the pipeline would go by, right? And so my job was initially to talk, start talking to non-Indian or settlers as you would call them in our territory and see if we could get them to understand that this was a bit of a problem. So we wrote a lot of articles, started doing some events, and pretty soon we found that, you know, they was pretty concerned too. And I, a long time ago I learned that if you get the Norwegians mad, they can stick to it, you know? <laughs> that was my plan, let's get those guys all going on this, you know? So we built this multiracial alliance, you know, a little loose because I have to say we're not in politically all the same place. Some of those people aren't real comfortable on Native people still. And a lot of times, a lot of you people know what this is like. I just don't even bother going in the room. I'm like, I send the white guy in. I'm like, y'all yeah, talk to him because I can't carry your bags, right? I'm busy, you know? <laughs> y'all know what this is like, right? It's like sending that white guy, he could talk to y'all. It's all good. <laughs> Right, but you know, we, we, gotta, we gotta protect our water. We gotta protect our water, so we all need to figure out how to do it together, you know? So um, we build this alliance, we start, you know, we prayed, we had ceremonies, we rode our horses against the current of the oil, because I dreamed we should ride our horses against the current of the oil. People know me a little bit, like I have horses, I have horses, but I'm like the girl who likes to ride. I'm not like a Lakota horse rider, you know? So I like to ride. And so I dreamed I should ride my horses, and then I, so I went out and told the Lakotas, I said, I think you're supposed to ride your horses against the KXL. And they all looked at me, the White Plume family, they said, that's a good dream. That's a good dream, and we'll get back to you on that. We'll have some ceremonies, you know? <laughs> right? I was like, okay, good. And then I went home, and they announced this pipeline. And I was like, oh, you know that thing, that burden of dreams? I was like, well, maybe I'm, I'm supposed to do that, you know? So then first I go out and get a horse trailer. My kids are like, you don't even have a truck to haul that horse trailer, right? I like no idea what I'm doing, but I got it on Craigslist, I was all happy, you know? <laughs> I get this truck and then I go on Craigslist and I get, a, I get a trailer first and then I got a truck that I could pick up the trailer with and, you know, and then I summoned up these riders and we started riding. So we've ridden for five years now. And uh, they did a film on us, it's called First Daughter and the Black Snake and it tells our story of our battle. So for five years, we, four years is what we did. We prayed, we, we struggled, we went to every regulatory hearing, we did everything in the white man paper process. And uh, we joined together with these other groups and they, we, their lawsuit was filed by the non-Indian people, the settlers, and the, the lawsuit uh, went into the Minnesota courts and forced the state of Minnesota to do an environmental impact statement on the proposed pipeline. Enbridge did not want an EIS. So in that process, Enbridge became very flustered and the process dragged on because the state appealed that and didn't want to do an EIS and then the court ordered them to do an EIS, right? That's how the system doesn't work, right? You know, but finally we got this EIS and uh, times drag on and they had, Enbridge had shared with its shareholders that it was gonna get that pipeline. They were all good on it. And then they had to do this EIS and they became more and more tense. So last year on August 2nd, August 2nd of 2016, the Enbridge Corporation announced that it was not going to continue with the Sandpiper. It was drawing all its permits out and they were canceling that project. So that's what our people did. So I tell you this story because this is what we did. We, you can stop a pipeline. I wanna say you can stop a pipeline. And that's what we did in our community. And a lot of people think you can't fight these corporations, but you can fight these corporations and you must fight these corporations. But what that corporation did is that corporation went out and bought 28% of the Dakota Access Pipeline. That's what they did because they saw a pipeline that was going through rough shot over any federal law with no respect for anybody. And they saw that that project was moving ahead. 
And so they went out there and they emboldened the Energy Transfer Corporation because Energy Transfer didn't really have the money to do that pipeline until Enbridge came in and bankrolled it. That Canadian corporation, Enbridge, bankrolled that, that pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so we, like many of you, followed that corporation out there. This is a little of the background on this pipeline. You know, what I'm trying to understand is why we are justifying any of this. Do you know what I'm saying? Is why are they justifying this oil? Why are they justifying this process? I refer to it as Windigo economics. You know, I spent a lot of time in college and I, I'm, I'm an economist by training, but you look out there and this economics of laying to waste all of the territory and making some kind of a cost benefit analysis that you sell to your shareholders that you're gonna make a profit on it without any, any responsibility is when it, it is the economics of a cannibal. That's what it is, because you're eating the heart, you're eating your mother herself, and then you are pretending like you are gonna survive in that. And that is part of what we must challenge is the whole economic paradigm that somehow justifies these practices. This is what it looks like in, in North Dakota, and that's where that pipeline comes from. This is what it looks like socially in North Dakota. And everybody knows the story of missing and murdered Native women, and everybody knows the sex trafficking that occurs around these oil fields and occurs around the man camps in our territories. But this is a billboard taken out by some white people in North Dakota who are sick of looking at all the sex trafficking and the abuse in North Dakota. So this is part of the psychosis that I think it's really, really important to acknowledge because it's the psychosis that allowed, you know, in North Dakota, a state that largely had been abandoned. And I say that because some parts of Canada, I'm sure it is similar, but people left North Dakota. Children left North Dakota and they left their parents out there. They left these farms out there and more and more people left until they say that North Dakota returned to something called frontier status, less than one person per square mile in a lot of North Dakota. And so they, they depopulated and then the oil companies came in and could easily prey on the people out there. And nobody in civil society paid attention to North Dakota and it is not that different than the northern provinces here. Because a perfect example of that is the American Civil Liberties Union. The American Civil Liberties Union, which is the organization that is to fight for your civil rights in the country, had one person that covered both North and South Dakota. The Sierra Club had one person in North Dakota. Nobody wanted to go to North Dakota, and nobody wanted to look at what was going out there. No one wanted to deal with the racism. Nobody wanted to deal with the colonization, the oppression, the arrest rates for Native people. The fact that, you know, two of the poorest counties in the country are on Standing Rock. Nobody wanted to talk about what was happening, and instead they just wanted to just fly over North Dakota. And so I'm telling you this because what happened at Standing Rock didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened because we refer, we refer to North Dakota as the Deep North. We refer to North Dakota as the Deep North, and that's what it looks like. And here's a picture of the Deep North. A couple years ago, a film came out called Welcome to Leith. Welcome to Leith. And it's a story about this town in North Dakota that was purchased by the Nazis, the neo-Nazi movement. They purchased a whole town because nobody lived there. And they wanted to set up a little compound, right? They set up a little compound out there. But because we are courageous people, these are some of the women you saw at Standing Rock. That is Madonna Thunderhawk. That is Phyllis Young. That's Mabel Ann Chasinghawk, and I forget this sister's name. But they captured the flag of the Nazis of Leith, North Dakota. Because <laughs> someone in North Dakota has courage, and it is us. It is indigenous people, and they burn that flag. And this year, similarly, the church named the President Donald Trump Creativity Church of Rome in Nome, North Dakota was burned to the ground. I have no idea how that happened, but Donald Trump's church burned in North Dakota. <laughs> I'm just trying to say it's a little strange out in North Dakota. Y'all get that? <laughs> like that's some weird stuff going on out there in North Dakota, but it goes on in Saskatchewan and Alberta and the places where the neo-Nazis and the right are out there and there's usually just native people and these crazy people. Pretty much, you know, from what I can figure. So I say that because that's how it all happened. 
That's how it went down. It didn't just happen in a vacuum. It happened because all this has been going on out there in North Dakota and nobody in the rest of the country who's all progressive and all those progressive movements, social movements, who want to talk about all those cool things, they didn't want to go to North Dakota. They didn't want to go to North Dakota because it wasn't cool and they figured there wasn't like a Starbucks there or, you know what I'm saying? You couldn't like get, you know, you, you, how many of you guys were at Standing Rock? I bet some of you guys went to Standing Rock. Let me see. And I bet the rest of you supported us. Thank you. You know, thanks for going out there. You know, but what I'm saying is it's like, you know, you get up there to Bismarck and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, all, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what we saw when we went out there. I love these kids. Um, I see, for some reason, this is what we saw. Now, the thing about this that's really important is that this is some equipment that we saw. This a piece of equipment is known as, a, uh, the one on the right is known as an MRAP, a mine-resistant armored personnel carrier. Mine-resistant armored personnel carrier. And the other piece of equipment is known as an LRAD, long-range acoustic device. And this is what they deployed on us at Standing Rock. And this is the problem that exists in the United States. I, I don't think that it exists in Canada. This is a problem where you surplus your extra military equipment to civilian police forces. Now, under the Obama administration, that, po that process ended. But under the Trump administration, about a month ago, he reinstated it, right? And what is really horrible about that is that first piece of equipment, the MRAP, MRAP my, I had to ask someone what it was, Mine Resistant Armored Personnel Carrier, like, that belongs to Stutzman County. It says on the side, Stutzman County. And Stutzman County might have, like, 5,000 people in the county, right? They don't have a building that would require an MRAP. You know what I'm saying? They got, like, some barns, right? You know what I'm saying? This is like a farming and ranching community. They don't need an MRAP to drive through. That's for, designed to drive through buildings in industrial cities, right? And to drive into the building. That's what they have that. And the LRAD... You know, there's no purpose. But they, what they thought in North Dakota, you know, what they thought they could do in North Dakota was that they could do this because we're natives. They could do it because they were used to treating native people as third-class citizens in North Dakota, and they thought they could just get away with that, and they had all this extra equipment. And then the state of North Dakota, as some of you know, in, our, in the recently, inc you know, the set of releases of Freedom of Information Act material, on North Dakota, we found that, in fact, most of the operations were directed by a group called Tiger Swan, which is actually just out of Afghanistan. Military contractors that directed the unified command of all the forces that they spent $30 million on oppressing us and injuring us. This is what it looked like. This is what it looked like. This is what it looks like when you get sprayed with a bunch of stuff, you don't even know what it is. And this picture, you know, these pictures here are not unlike some of the pictures from, I mean, it wasn't so militarized in New, New Brunswick. The Mi'kmaq battles over the fracking. But it is still the same question of when you get to a point in this society where the rights of corporations supersede the rights of individuals. And your addiction to oil makes you behave so poorly. For me and for many of us in, in our territory, we refer to this moment at Standing Rock as a Selma moment, as a Selma moment where we came face to face with what we were looking at and everybody saw what was going down, you know. This is O'Shea as we're leaving. You know, my organization, Honor the Earth, was out there from April until the end. I was in and out of there, you know, quite a bit. My horses, my teepee, my horse trailers, my yurt, my family. My family took some bullets. My family took some injuries. I lost a horse out there. So I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of, you know, I, I told Embridge at a re meet, reading mis meeting recently, I was in a meeting with Embridge, I said, I have a lot of PTSD from Standing Rock. And, um, but this is when we left. And then O'Shea and the others, the last ones there, they burned that which was left. And LaDonna Allard, the woman who was uh, kind of the host of the Sacred Stone Camp, said that people burned it out of grief. They burned it out of grief. And so part of what I want to say about this is that, you know, when I go home tomorrow, I am now facing a second Ambridge pipeline. 
That is line three. Enbridge's line three is their single largest project, a $7 billion pipeline, 915,000 barrels a day of tar sands oil. It's predicated on Enbridge's need to keep up its greed and to move oil out of the Canadian tar sands. I know that there are a number of pipeline projects that are proposed because Canada is a petro state. 90% of your income is based on that petrodollar. And so Canada is trying to do anything to get that dead oil out. And they are supporting it, and I'm fully aware, you know, I'm fully aware of the battles up here. I'm aware and support the battles on Energy East, Kinder Morgan pipelines, all of those pipelines. I don't think that the Keystone pipeline is going anywhere, frankly. But this one, I believe, is the one that they are all betting on. I think that they are betting on this. And Enbridge is certainly betting on this. And as you know, they are building towards us from Saskatchewan right now. And they are also building towards Minnesota from Wisconsin right now. And my people are getting arrested in Wisconsin now. Every day someone else gets arrested trying to stop that line from getting to the Minnesota border. But what you should know, what you should know is two weeks ago, the state of Minnesota Department of Commerce the agency which gives the recommendation on issuing the permit for that pipeline. It's called a certificate of need. The Department of Commerce recommended against issuing Enbridge a permit for that pipeline. Now, we don't know how that's gonna go. Like I said, the fat lady didn't sing yet, you know what I mean? Enbridge is gonna do everything it can to get that line and we are gonna do everything that is necessary to stop them from getting it. And I, I just wanna say a couple more things on that is first, I wanna say that since the Enbridge Corporation financed 28% of the Dakota Access Pipeline, and that pipeline could have not gone ahead without them, the day after they put the dogs on our people, September 4th, when they put the dogs on our people, I called Enbridge. I have a little person there named Linda Cody who I talked to. We used to have this person who was the tribal relations specialist. We had two of them. We referred to them as the Indian whispers. <laughs> <laughs> we burned through all the Indian whispers. They got nowhere. When they hit our border and they came in with their tribal relations specialist, I said, I know who you are, Enbridge, because I was at the Northern Gateway hearings. I saw those villages you went through. I saw the oil and those are small, remote communities you rolled through with diesel generators. I said, we are not small communities. There's 22,000 members of my tribe and we have jurisdiction over a large area. There are five very large tribes in Minnesota that have all opposed that pipeline. I said, we are not small tribes. You're not gonna roll over us. You know, so they kept having us talk to them and now I talked to this woman named Linda Cody and I called Linda and I said, Linda, you need to call off the dogs. The Enbridge Corporation has an Aboriginal people's policy. They already have six pipelines here and they say that they want to work with First Nations. To work with First Nations, you have to do an environmental impact assessment. You have to have consent. Free, prior, and informed consent is what you have to have. Not some consent that was coerced, right? And you have to, you have to be respectful for us. I called them, it sounds like a dysfunctional relationship. I called them, I texted them, and I wrote them emails, right? <laughs> right? Al, that's who I talked to, or you know, Al Monaco, he, know, he, he and I know each other. He's the president. He doesn't like me too much. But I, I said, you know, you need to do this, Enbridge. You need to call off the dogs. You need to stop, because Enbridge could have stopped that. Enbridge could have stopped that because they had the financing that made that project possible but they stood aside and they let us get shot. They let us get tear gassed. They let us get injured. They let people lose eyes. They let people lose arms. They let a lot of us get poisoned. And they let 840 of us get arrested. So we, the Anishinaabe, hold Enbridge responsible. We hold them responsible for 28% of the injuries, 28% of the arrests. 28% of the bullets, 28% of the tear gas, and 28% of whatever it is where, that is ailing us today because we have the dapple cough and they oversprayed us every night. 
We hold them responsible and we are not, we have no amnesia. We didn't forget. We didn't forget. When they came into Minnesota, they act like that didn't happen. I said, no, we were there. We were there. So I want to say that because indigenous people have long memories. We cannot forget these things. We cannot forget who these corporations are and we cannot forget, of course, who we are. This is our billboards in Bismarck today, if you ever go back there. Those are nice, huh? As the trials occur for our water protectors, we decided we should take out some billboards, basically, love a water protector. We're doing our best. It's kind of hard terrain out there in Bismarck to get someone to love a water protector, but I tell you, aren't they cute? I feel they're very cute. You know, I'm like, <laughs> love a water protector, aren't we cute? I feel like this is our moment. I feel like this is our moment. You know, you got a choice between two paths, one is well-worn and it is scorched. You know, this is a graphic by the same guy who did the really great billboard. His name is Votan. Votan. But I like this because it is really about this moment. And as I think about where it is we are going, I think of this, I refer to this moment as the time of the sitting bull plan. The sitting bull plan. And I say that because to the south, you know, it is insane and you know that. I feel like, you know, first you have like the, these, these storms of biblical proportions on the south side, right? You know, you have storms and then to the west you have forest fires, right? This is the climate change insanity that we have walked into and then to the east we have a crazy guy with orange hair screaming at us all, right? And so he has a plan, but you and I know that that is not an enlightened plan. The enlightened plan would be a Sitting Bull plan. And what Sitting Bull said is he said, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. That's what we got to do. We all got to put our minds and our hearts together to make where it is we are going. Because we are awake. We are awake. We are present. We know who we are and we know what is happening. We are more than coherent. You know, I have this great privilege. I spent the week traveling, traveling, and there are so many, so many enlightened, brilliant, courageous, vocal, and gifted young people. I'm so grateful to you all. I'm so grateful and I see that power and I know that we put our minds together and we'll make this change. So let me talk about the change and the transition. This is the thing that bothers me about these pipelines, Windigo economics, and it is the same thing anywhere you look. When you are fracking, it is the bottom of the barrel, the bottom of the barrel. It's, it's an era known as an era of extreme extraction, and that's what you are seeing. That's what you are seeing up in the north in the ring of fire. That's what you are seeing in tar sands. We're in an era where everything that it was easy to get, you already got, right? The oil that is out there now is no longer like gushing out of some oil well like Oklahoma. To get anything else, you got to either bust up the bedrock of Mother Earth and shove 602 chemicals down there and pretend that that's going to work out for you with fracking, right? You got to either turn asphalt into something you can shove into a pipe. That'd be the tar sands. Drill 20,000 feet under the ocean, you know, and think that's going to work out for you until you get the deep water horizon, right? Or do some crazy mining project where there's like, in our territory, Canadian mining corporations are going after copper. The percentage is so low, it's one ton of copper and a million tons of waste. That's Windigo economics. That's the bottom of the barrel. That's in insanity. That pipeline in North Dakota, the average well, lasts five years. That's why they have to keep fracking. And they can't frack because they don't have the money to because why the price of Saudi oil is low. And in order to extract that oil, you got to keep building new wells. And you got to keep opening up new wells. So it's not cheap oil. Five years. And so this is how egregious their crime is. In 2016, Lynn Helms, the director of mines for North Dakota, and the Industrial Commission, he's like the czar of North Dakota's extraction. Lynn Helms said that in 2016, there was 900,000 barrels of oil 
going to move out of the Bakken oil fields, right? And then he said in 2017, there was 900,000 barrels of oil going to move out of the Bakken oil fields. In the meantime, there's an 87% drop in drilling in the Bakken. So it's flatlined. So 900,000 barrels in 2016, 900,000 barrels a day. This is a barrels a day moving out of the Bakken in 2017. All the oil that was going out in 2016 went out already. You know what I'm saying? It already went out on some pipe or on some train or in some form. So why did they need a 570,000 barrel a day pipeline? Why'd they need that pipeline? They didn't need that pipeline. That was about hatred. That was about greed. That was about shoving a pipeline down our throats. That was about some corporate profits. And this is about the end of the fossil fuel era. That's what this is about. So this is us. In my lifetime, I have uh, consumed half the world's known oil. I've really had a great time. Y'all have a good time? <laughs> Been a blast. I mean, I drove around, I flew around. I've had a really good time. Sometimes I, just to really push it, some days I like to get that Fiji water. You know what I'm talking about? It comes from Fiji, right? So it's got to be the water from the furthest part of the planet. <laughs> Tastes really good, but its carbon footprint is like, wow, really? Really going to enjoy that water? You know, what an insane economy. And I was trying to figure out, because like, I live down there in what they call the United States. And, you know, I was like, in the world, there's only one country that consumes more energy per capita than an American. Per capita, one country consumes more energy than an American. And I was like, how could you consume more than an American? And I was like, oh, you could be a Canadian. <laughs> you're, the, you're it, you guys. You consume more energy per capita than anybody else in the world. Because you got inefficient systems, you got crazy ass buildings, you're shipping stuff all over, right? And uh, you know, your fuel efficiency is probably like zero or something up here. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, that's crazy. So we all did this, we partied. Everything else that's there is going to be hard to get. Like I said, you're going to have to like bust stuff up to destroy it, to just get that last little bit of oil. So my position is, is that now would be the time for an elegant transition. <laughs> know what I mean? Like we can like crash our way out. You can wait till every single ecosystem is like fried and you know, climate change, who knows, right? or we can just start moving on, right? I'm like, let's be gracious, let's move on. And we all know that it's hard. I mean, because the fact is, is that we live in societies that are full of addicts, you know? And I, I have addicts in my family and they're kind of a drag, you know? I mean, my one addiction solidly is caffeine. You know, I gotta have my cup of coffee and it's good. But you know what I'm saying? It's just like, thankfully, I don't have any other addictions, right? But these, you know, you know, if anybody's living with an addict, you know that they're kind of a drag. They like rationalize stuff. It's always someone's fault. You ever notice that? Like, you know, how'd that happen? Oh, they did it, you know? It's like always, you know? They lie, things get bad, they kind of steal or cheat, you know? Right? But that's what we're doing. That's what's going on, you know? We basically act like a big addict. You know, the US and Canada, big addicted countries, like we're all like in the same canoe. We like, you know, if, if, you're, if your cell phone's down, you're like all freaked out, right? I'm gonna go buy one of those things I saw it on the sacred Amazon that you can charge your cell phone with a hand charger. You know what I'm saying? I'm shipping it out to the camp on line three. I'm like, y'all quick whine and here's your chargers, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's so ridiculous, our use of energy. But anyway, and we all act like addicts. If you don't get it fixed, you're like this, you know? Freaked out about it. So addicts make bad decisions. That's just what I want to say. And that's how your public policy got written by a bunch of dealers. <laughs> Welcome to Canada. Your public policy was written by a bunch of dealers, from what I can figure, right? Same thing in the United States. So dealers shouldn't write public policy. You know, addicts shouldn't either. Enlightened people should. So this is the sitting bull plan time. So you guys, it's not gonna hang in too long anyway. You know, how I know it's not gonna work out is this price of oil. And then this is the other reason I know it's not gonna work out, a couple other reasons. So this, you know, we always think that these energy companies are like infallible. Smartest guys in the world, right? Okay, so being the geek that I am, although I think Deborah might be geekier than me, this year, you know, 2011, 
three largest U.S. oil companies had 80.4 billion in net income, right? I mean, that's a lot of money. They were all feeling pretty sweet about themselves, right? And then look what happened to them. Get down here in 2016, they're only at 3.7 billion in net income. Now the biggest guys, Exxon, big guys, Exxon, right? Those are like supposed to be like top dogs in the world, right? More powerful than anything. They're at 40.1 billion in 2011. And by 2016, they're at 2.7 billion or 2.8 billion in net income, right? That's not smartest guys in the world. If you, I mean, like, so let me get this right. If I was the CEO of Exxon, right? If I was the CEO of Exxon and I lost that much money in five years, you understand what I'm saying? You think I'd still have a job? Probably not. But the smartest guy in the world just appointed him, that would be Rex Tillerson, is the US Secretary of State, right? My point is, is that he didn't get the memo, right? He didn't get the memo that things were changing. If he was so smart, he wouldn't have lost all that money. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get that money back, of course. And our job is to stop them from getting that money back because they get that money back and they destroy the planet. So this is us at the Enbridge shareholders meeting in May. I like, to pres I like to just go visit Enbridge different times. We took our jingle dress dancers up there. That's my cousin Annie Humphrey dancing. And um, you know, I want to be clear. We, we took four jingle dress dancers up to Calgary. You know, because I believe a corporation that, dis that wants to destroy my water should see my face. I believe corporations should be responsible for their behavior. This is this moment. You know, this is what I think the future is going to look like. This is an old guy from my reservation. His name is Nagani Benes, or Leading Bird. And uh, I actually have this piece of art, but uh, he's looking out his window, and that's what he sees. Jonathan Thunder is the artist on this. So this is what the future looks like. Um, in, in my life, like, I'm not very techie but I, I am smart enough to know to have smart people work with you. And so we did this project on the Navajo Reservation. This is the Navajo, um, or Diné College on the Navajo Reservation. And we used what's called sulfur, sulfur emissions money that was set aside by Southern California Edison, matched it with some private foundation money and put uh, solar on the roof of that facility at, um, on the Navajo Reservation. This project, some of you know, this is Melina Lubicon. And this is one of my favorite young women illustrating the brilliance of this next generation. I happen to be on her master's committee for her, I think she was at the University of Victoria. And her master's project was to, in her village of Little Buffalo, they had a diesel generator for their uh, clinic. And so her job was to put solar up. And so her master's thesis was putting it in. That's cool, huh? And so she inspired me, and I'm about, to, uh, I'm about to copy her project and put solar on a tribal school on my reservation. You know, my thinking is, is that, you know, if you're waiting for somebody to fix this for you, you're going to be waiting a long time. You know, my friend Bob Goff, he passed away a couple of weeks ago, but he used to say, he had this great saying, which was, you're, you're either at the table or you are on the menu, <laughs> right? What you want to be. So this is our idea. Now it's stuck. No, here it goes, wait, here. So there's a cool buffalo. I think that's cute. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to relocalize our energy. I'll just talk a little bit more about that. And we got to relocalize our food. Now, these two things are entirely closely related. And that's because you know, in North America or in the United States, we basically ship food in from everywhere else. And if you're from a northern village, you're basically hemorrhaging your entire economy in buying food from northern stores, right? And so my reservation is a little bit different, we, but we did a study a couple years ago, and uh, we figured that we spent about $8 million of food um, on my for food on my reservation. It's about a quarter of our economy is food. And of that, we spent 86% off reservation buying food at Walmart, bringing it in from Food Service of America or Sodexo or somebody else bringing it in, right? 
And so one of the challenges that we face as we think about what the next economy, the sustainable economy is gonna look like is, is that, you know, they always talk about bringing in new jobs to our communities or bringing in these projects and their benefit sharing agreements. We were talking about that. You know, like all that stuff, you're gonna get some money, but it's not gonna change your structure. You still hemorrhage. And the point is, is why keep bringing in money if you're still gonna hemorrhage? So what you gotta do is figure out how to relocalize your food economy and quit hemorrhaging. And you need to do the, exactly the same thing with energy in all of our northern and our remote villages so that we don't hemorrhage half our economy. This is how far food travels. Do I keep burning you guys out or what? <laughs> all right. So this is, you know, for us, the average meal travels 1,400 miles from farmer to table in the United States. I don't even want to know what Pewanix average, <laughs> you know, it's like 7,000 miles, right, or something. I have no idea, right? So this is my, our project in my community. Um, my father came to visit me when I was a young woman, an, an undergraduate at Harvard. He was pretty much old school guy, went to school till like the eighth grade, um, really smart indigenous guy, Anishinaabe man. And he came and he saw me and he was super proud of me, but he said, Winona, I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I say that because we can be all smart, but how are you going to eat? That's the basics of it, right? How are you all going to eat if you, you know what I'm saying? How are you going to eat? All right. <laughs> So in my uh, community, I decided to become a corn grower. And uh, so this is the kind of corn I grow. This Bear Island Flint, this is what I grow the most of. It's uh, a northern hominy corn, um, short growing season, frost resistant, uh, wind resistant, drought resistant. You know, when the big winds came through a couple years ago, blew over all the GMO corn, mine stood, right? You got to plant for climate change. You got to plant for climate change. Two, twice the uh, protein and half the calories of market varieties. Rocks the B vitamins when you cook it with your ashes. That's how you cook a hominy. You have to cook it with ashes. And that's what it does is it bioactivates the B vitamins. So that's what we grow. This one in the middle is this pink lady corn. This is a magenta pink colored corn. And someone asked me, how come I grow pink corn? And I said, because I like pink. And they said, why don't you grow blue corn? I said, why don't you grow blue corn? There's 8,000 varieties, right? You know what I'm saying? Next time someone tries to boss you around and tell you what color to buy, tell them to grow their own corn or, you know, grow. <laughs> and then this one here is uh, one of my favorite corns. I, I, I don't have the right to grow it. It's a Pawnee Eagle corn. That's cool looking, huh? And uh, they almost lost that corn. And uh, the Pawnees, known as the Arikaras, the Arikaras, they lived up there in uh, the, northern Missouri, uh, the, the northern Missouri River Valley, up there north of Standing Rock. That's where they came from. And uh, when the woman descended from the sky, she descended in a corn husk. When the man descended, he descended in a buffalo robe. That's their creation story. That's cool, huh? And so they had all this corn. They had all these varieties. And they, uh, one day they moved. They decided to split up. And some of them headed south. And they became the Pawnees. And they took their varieties with them. And they lived down in what's known as Nebraska. And um, they lived good there. You know, things went good for them. And then when the government came, they got along pretty good with the settlers, too. That's what they told me. They said that they, you know, they, they, they all worked together pretty good. But then the government came in and forced their relocation. Three forced relocations to uh, Oklahoma. And they grieved so much. They grieved because they lost their ancestors. They lost their land. A lot of their people perished on the way. And then they grieved because most of their varieties would not grow. And so they dwindled down. They dwindled down. And then one day, this is the way the story was told to me by Deb Echohawk. This woman named Ronnie O'Brien called the Pawnees and said, we'd like to grow your, your corn. We're from Kearney, Nebraska, the town you all came from. And they, they said, we don't really have much, you know, and they, but they deliberated, all the Pawnee elders deliberated. And then when the Pawnee elders deliberated, they decided to send their seeds back. 
And so they sent their seeds back to their territory that they came from. And what they told me was that the seeds remembered the land it came from. And all of their varieties flourished. It's cool, huh? And so I like that story for a lot of reasons. You know, um, a few years ago they had Welcome Home Pawnee Days in Kearney, Nebraska. And 150 Pawnee came in on some buses. And uh, 8,000 people came out to see them. So to me, it's really important, that story, because one thing, first, is corn doesn't exist in nature. It's something that we as humans created with nature. And I think it's always really important to reaffirm that humans are beautiful, and we can do beautiful things. Because all those varieties of corn were created by beautiful, like Josephine Mandamin. <laughs> we're created, you know? And I, I, I think a lot about that. You know, I think a lot about that because, um, and a lot of those varieties were seed selected by women. Women are the best at that for some reasons that may not be obvious, but they are actually obvious when you think about it is because we have to, we have to prepare them and we have to store them. So it's not just how plentiful they are, but it's how they cook, right? And how they store. And so all of those, all of that intellectual property and beauty was what our communities did. And nobody in a white suit did that, right? Nobody owned it. Seeds belong to the creator. And the other reason I like that story is because it's a story of redemption. You know, the Pawnee story is you can fix something. You know, you could fix something. And so those farmers fix something. They help that for those varieties come back and they return some of their land to those Pawnees. You know, so that's what I like. I want to see redemption and I want to see, you know, more than rec reconciliation. You know, I want, I want to see a healing between the settler, the colonizer, and the host people. I want to see that, but it takes an action, not just a word. It takes an action. This is our cool squash. I grow these two varieties. This one here came back this year. I planted a seed. I didn't know if that was the right one, and then it showed up. I said, oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. This squash, uh, I got the first seeds from this guy from Menominee Reservation. He said, the story he told me was that the seeds came out of this clay ball that was found in an archaeological dig near Green Bay, Wisconsin. They shook that ball, and in it there were seeds. They cracked it open. They found those seeds, and then they carbon dated it and said it was about 800 years old. That's what they said. And then someone told me that wasn't right. They said that they were actually 1,000 years old, and they were Miami seeds. I said, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know how like, people got to get that all straight? I was like, okay. You know, but the thing I liked about that was the clay ball, because that's like a really ingenious, indigenous system of seed storage, because the clay wicks, keeps it dry, right? You know, and you got that big seed vault everywhere, but I think you need to, I'm going to trust the clay vault, you know? <laughs> and then, um, so people asked me what that was called after I started talking about it, and I grew it, and they said, I don't know what it's called. I said, but then I decided I'd name it. I said, white guys name stuff all the time, huh? They're like all busy naming everything. Mountains after themselves, and streets, and stars, and planets, and oh my God, they're so busy naming, <laughs> right? Like, what is it with white guys and naming? They got to, like, name everything, right? So I said, okay, I'll name it. So I call it Gete Okosamen, which Anishinaabe Moan speakers know means something like, something like, kind of like, really cool old squash. <laughs> <laughs> Some people call it the time traveler squash. You know, I think it's just cool. It cooks good, stays long. It's my community. That's the Thompson's ricin on big rice. That's what we're fighting for. This is what a sustainable economy looks like. We'll go with 8,000 years racing in the same lake. You let me know any facet of this American or Canadian economy that represents sustainability like that, right? And all we got to do is take care of our water. Every year that rice comes back. Every year that rice comes back, and that's the lake that that pipeline would go by. This year, I really like this picture. Okay, so if you guys think that... Uh, you're gonna have trouble gardening. Check these guys out. This is my friend Lona Sorensen, and she lived up in Northwest Territories in Yellowknife, and she grew all that stuff, right? 
And she has like some greenhouses, but those guys don't even have any soil up there. They have like Canadian shield, right? You know what I'm saying? So they had to like make soil. They had to compost and you know what I'm saying? They had to like keep making soil. And this is just like the north, right? This is just like, you know, probably a moose factory, all them villages in the north, they gotta make more soil. And so she, so I was like, so they have these raised beds to make their soil in, right? And I was like, so what you use in your raised beds? And she says, we use like pine needles and we use like, you know, all this stuff she says. And then she says, and then I saw all this caribou hair. And so she put the caribou hair in her raised bed and the hair releases uh, calcium, right? I was like, that's really badass, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? This is like, so like, I feel like if you can grow that with caribou hair, you know, they don't got much of a growing season or anything. I'm like, what's up? Let's just do this, right? All right, these are some other cool pictures. These guys are the chicken people of the north, right? This is Garden Hill Reserve, fly-in community in northern Manitoba. This guy is chicken man. And they brought in all these chickens, and that's where they stay up there because these guys, same thing as every other fly-in village, they don't really have food, so they want eggs, right? So they started this project in uh, Manitoba. And they've been flying these chickens in and then raising chickens in these little villages. And, you know, so I'm like, let's just do that stuff, right? And this is my favorite guy for urban agriculture. This guy's name is Will Allen. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him, but he runs this thing called Growing Power. And he is in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, he has these greenhouses in downtown Milwaukee. And he raises a million pounds on three acres of land. Now... Toronto. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's what y'all need to do. You know, you need to have every, you know, urban native community, every urban community should have Will Allen's project, right? That's in Milwaukee. That's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Growing power, that's what it's called. He's like one of my superheroes. This is the next generation of energy. This is a wind project off of, off of, uh, uh, Massachusetts. This is what the future looks like. You know, when I say this transition, I don't know how Indian reservations are the windiest place in the country, <laughs> but I know that's what you got. Look at Standing Rock. You know, so we did a little mathy thing and we figured the $3.8 billion that they spent on the Dakota Access Pipeline, if we just like used that for renewables, we would have had 323 two megawatt wind turbines, right? We would have had 161,253 or something like that uh, solar arrays of eight kilowatts each for houses of North Dakota. And then if you put solar thermal on the rest of the houses, you would have had 61,000 of those. So I was like, that's what energy security looks like. Duh. You know what I'm saying? It's like you spend $3.9 billion on a pipeline that nobody wants. Or you put up enough wind to, to, you know, wind and solar to reduce the misery of the people in North Dakota, and you could export it, you know? You guys have pretty much no excuse. You have exactly the same wind regime. <laughs> you know, in that James Bay, that's why I was asking about that Pewanic wind project, so I don't know how you guys are gonna work that out, but you got, you got like class seven wind up there, but y'all know it's windy, right? You don't need me to tell you that? No, it's very windy. And uh, people say, you know, you can't ever meet present demand with renewable energy. And I always say, why would you want to? Why would you want to? Because between point of origin and point of consumption in the United States, 57% of our energy is wasted. Canada's probably about 65%, right? You got real old power plants. You know, like, they got like 80-year-old coal generators in the United States. Like, my mother is 84 and kicks my butt at yoga. But you know what I'm saying? An 80-year-old coal generator? What's that? Then you got them, you know, really inefficient mining systems, and then you got these, you know, long power lines because they sold us all this idea of the economy of scale. By the time you're done, you waste 57% of your power. So why would you want to do it with renewables? What you would want to do is get efficient, right? You would want to get local. You'd like to train your people in it, and that's the difference that you're going to make. And how I know it's all going to work out is I went and visited this one lady named Mara Mara Prentice at Harvard University, and what Mara said is this, she said, uh, she's a physics professor, 
She said the reason that the energy revolution is going to transition is because the combustion engine in your car, every one of our cars, or if you got one, is 16% efficient. And a Tesla or an electric engine is 65% efficient. So why wouldn't you want to go electric? What kind of stupid economy would hang around with a 16% efficient engine, right? Time to move on, elegant transition. This is the memo that Exxon missed. All the investments are in that. The divestment movement, a lot of us are a part of, and we need to redouble, and we are asking and calling on you to help us to begin the divestment on the Line 3 project, because that's what we need. We need them to quit coming towards us. This is my village. <laughs> Looks fun, huh? That's a film called The Seventh Fire, what they did on our village a couple years ago. Village of Pine Point. They caught this burning moment. And it's, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff in my village. We got the same thing a lot of other people have. We have a meth and opioid epidemic, right? We've got a lot of poverty. We've got a lot of people that are self-medicating, a lot of despair, not a, 10 jobs in the whole damn village, right? Does this sound similar? Everybody else caught the same statistics, right? It's like horrible, right? So we look around, we say, well, let's see what we can do. So this is what I, what I work on. Like, this is what I really want to do. So we start by painting the houses. I know Christy would like this, huh? Yeah, we paint the houses in the housing project. I said, let's just make our life beautiful, you know? We put solar thermal on the south side of the houses in the housing project, the place nobody want to go. Reduce their heating bill by 15 to 20 percent. Let's get some misery out of there. And we did that ourselves. I train our own people to do all this stuff, right? That's cool, huh? That's one of our houses there. We got more murals going up because art is beautiful and our people are beautiful. That's what we're going to do. We're going to move on. We're going to move on. My community, we, we're doing a solar thermal manufacturing facility. And then, uh, you know, it's nothing new for you, but I'm one of the 26 people in the state of Minnesota that has an industrial hemp permit. My plan is to grow hemp. <laughs> That's the next economy. But I want to make fabric, and everybody knows that there's not even a damn fabric mill in between Canada and the United States that deals with hemp. So time to re-industrialize appropriately. Deindustrialize the unnecessary Windigo economy and re-industrialize in a level of appropriate technology that transitions us into an affirming economy. And pray. You all see this before? This is Emoto. This is Emoto, and I really like this because it, not only does it give me hope, but it reaffirms. Mr. Emoto did these studies on water crystals. You all know this, right? And if they were polluted, they prayed or they sang to them. Or they say things to them and they, you know, the world is full of spirits. We are spirits too. The world is full of power. We are power too. Use your power. Use your spirits. Pray. Pray to that water. Pray to that water. Take care of that water because she brings us her life. You all know this. This is what we don't want. And this is one of our ladies leaving Standing Rock. We are a happy people. We were there. Not only did we survive it, but we grew stronger from it. We're at this moment in time where it is upon us to make a decision about where we are going to go. You know, and as I think about that, I leave you with a quote. I was uh, looking at my friends out at, at, at uh, Pine Ridge. There's a group called the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. If you ever want to look them up, some brilliance in them. So I read their annual report, and I was like, man, that's a good quote. And being a writer, I'm like, can I use that quote? Let me call them, right? So I call up, and my nephew, Nick Tilson, Nick Tilson answers the phone, or he says, he calls me back. He says, okay, auntie, you could use the quote, but I got to tell you where it come from. I says, okay. He says, this is the story he tells me. He says, so a bunch of us Oglalas, a bunch of us Oglala men were going into sweat, right, to sweat lodge ceremony, right? We was going into the lodge, and we was outside, and we was... We was, talking, we was talking about the tribal council did that and who didn't do that and who was like, you know, they're basically talking smack, you know. And I just want to say that because we talk smack. Native people talk smack sometimes. 
And even at the inappropriate times, apparently, is when you're going into the sweat lodge. Sometimes smack is still being smoked. So, so anyway, they was all talking smack and trying to get themselves all ready or all walk on, ready to go in there, you know? And then they go in their lodge and they get in their lodge and this is what he told me. He said, this spirit came into the lodge and this is what that spirit said. He said, that spirit said, how long are you gonna let others determine the future for your children? Are we not warriors? When our ancestors went into battle, they did not know what the consequences were gonna be. All they knew is that if they did nothing, things would not go well for their children. Do not operate out of a place of fear. Operate out of a place of hope. Because with hope, everything is possible. The time is now. And that's what that spirit said to them. Miigwech, thank you for your time.